So I am the uh, director of the Waterloo Institute for Complexity and Innovation at the University of Waterloo. It's a new institute uh, that focuses in, at the intersection of complexity science and uh, processes of innovation, technological innovation, economic innovation. Uh, now this session is intended to elaborate on how complexity science might be of value to economics and understanding economic phenomena. We have a terrific group of speakers here today. Uh, and, uh, and actually, a, a better turnout considering the complexity of finding this place at the top of the building. So I'm very pleased to see that there are quite a few people here. Uh, we're going to move along because we're already quite late. And I'm just going to speak for a very few minutes. You'll find that the uh, information density of the presentations is going to increase like this. Uh, as we go forward, but I'm expecting that some of you are probably not very familiar with complexity theory, and so we'll start out with uh, some very simple concepts, and then as we progress, uh, the, everything will get much more sophisticated. Uh, but one of the uh, basic propositions I think that everybody on this panel today is working with is that uh, we need to shift from seeing the world as composed of mainly machines, and I'll explain what I mean by machines in a moment, simple machines, to seeing it as composed mainly of complex systems. And machines uh, are things like this, which you can disaggregate into their parts. Uh, when I talk about this with my students, uh, I often take exactly this kind of device into the seminar and I put it on the table and I say I can break this thing down into its component parts, its bushings and springs, uh, and all the other parts, and I can understand how these things go together in a very precise way and put them back together. And if the clock doesn't work properly, I can attribute the fact that it doesn't work properly to a problem usually with one part. It's out of place, it's bent or broken or missing or something like that. So we can say the machines have a, a number of characteristics. There are quite a few that you can identify. I've highlighted three here. They show proportionality of cause and effect. Small causes cause small effects. Big causes cause big effects. They exhibit normal or equilibrium patterns of behavior. It actually makes sense to say that the, that, that the clock is behaving normally, that it's working properly. That means something. We understand what that means. Uh, and they can be taken apart, analyzed, and fully understood. They are ultimately no more than the sum of their parts. And as a result, uh, their behavior can be managed because their behavior is predictable in some respects. Now, complex systems are different on each one of these points. They show disproportionality of cause and effect. Small, small causes can cause uh, very big effects, and sometimes very big changes in the systems don't cause any effect whatsoever. Uh, they can flip from one pattern of behavior to another. They have multiple equilibria something of great concern to economic theory right now. Uh, and they are ultimately more than the sum of their parts. They have emergent properties. Things happen that are novel when you put all the pieces together that you aren't uh, quite possibly not expecting at all. As I tell my students, it's a bit like when you put the pieces of the clock together and you finally have it all in, all in one, one machine, it sprouts a couple of legs, looks at you and says, hi, I'm out of here, and walks out the door. You know, you'd, look, you'd, you'd say, wow, where did that come from? I didn't expect that behavior at all. And frequently, complex systems are doing things that are really quite unanticipated because of these emergent properties. And as a result of these three characteristics, they cannot, uh, complex systems cannot be easily managed because their behavior is often unpredictable. Well, complexity science is uh, a field uh, is still r really quite underdeveloped. It's at the convergence point or has, is the result of a contribution uh, from a number of different established disciplines, including physics, mathematics, computer science. Uh, repeated mathematics twice there. Um, I just did this slide a few minutes ago. And then finally, more recently, uh, ecology uh, has made substantial contributions to complexity science. Uh, the value beyond these fields, especially in the social sciences, has not been fully established yet. And, and that's really the issue that we are going to be discussing today. In particular, the central question, 
how might complexity science contribute to our understanding of economic phenomena. Now, uh, you have the list of speakers in your program and you have uh, their bios, so I'm not going to repeat them right now. Um, slight difference in the order though, because of the nature of the topics that each speaker is addressing. We're moving from Don Farmer, who's sitting at the far end there, who will speak first, uh, to Jean-Philippe Bouchard, who's speaking second, and then Mauro Galagatti, and finally Ricardo Hausman. I've um, really been quite firm in suggesting to everyone that they should stick to their 15 minutes, uh, exactly 15 minutes, so that we have hopefully some time for discussion and conversation and questions afterwards. So with that, I'd like to begin right away with Don. Thank you. And can you give me a five minute warning? Sure. Um, so, um, uh, the let me explain the title of my talk. Actually, maybe we can get my talk up there. Um, I titled my talk, Complexity Economics, Are There Any Problems It Does Not Illuminate? I'm parodying the title of the session. I, I laughed when I saw the title of the session because I thought, what a strange thing to discuss. Uh, it seems to me obvious that most, eco most of economics, most economies are complex systems. Oh, sorry, Ricardo. Uh, most economies are complex systems and need to be discussed in those terms. And I was reminded of um, a lecture I heard in about 1977 when I was a graduate student in, my, in physics in my 20s by the great mathematician Stan Ulam. The lecture was on nonlinear mathematics, and he began the lecture by saying how embarrassed he was to use the term nonlinear mathematics because he said it's like calling an animal a non elephant animal. Almost all of mathematics are nonlinear, so why should we refer to almost everything in mathematics as nonlinear? Similarly, I think it's strange to even. Um, to refer to non-complex economics. There probably are some examples, but I don't think it would be very interesting to try and enumerate them. Um, I think I'm gonna assert boldly, and I'm gonna try and be provocative in my talk today, that the failure to treat the economy as a complex system is the principal reason that economics has failed to keep progress with the rest of science over the last 50 years. Um, and that's particularly unfortunate given its origins. Adam Smith was the first to clearly articulate what a complex system was, and Pareto was the first to identify a power law. I think those traditions have been lost uh, in economics. Uh, the central question in complex systems is how do emergent phenomena emerge from low-level building blocks? So, a second part of that is we attempt to build concepts and tools that transcend disciplines. For example, back in the 90s, I wrote a paper called The Rosetta Stone for Connectionism, where I showed that you could take examples of systems ranging from evolutionary game theory, autocatalytic networks for the origin of life, immune networks, neural nets, classifier systems in machine learning, and all you had to do was change the notation and they all mapped into a common framework. Um, and so people in complex systems have been trying to do that and develop tools and ideas that can be ported from one discipline to another to illuminate what's going on. Um, the method of complex systems, I would say, is to find low-level assumptions about the interaction of key building blocks that correctly reproduce high-level phenomena. Um, it's a data-driven, bottom-up approach. That is, you start with data, you try and make some assumptions about the low-level building blocks, if possible even calibrate your model directly against those low-level building blocks, and then use simulation or theory to try and see what they do when you hook them together. It's an approach that's been very successful in a lot of fields, epidemics, traffic, metabolism, almost every, or many branches of, of modern physics, and somewhat in economics, and we'll try and highlight that, I think, in today's panel. Um, I would say that the complex systems approach operates between the ideology-driven, top-down approach of economic theory and the data-driven but lacking in fundamentals approach of econometrics. Um, um, it tries to model the functional relationships between the components and make data-driven models of the low-level interactions. There's always a tension between fidelity of structure versus fidelity of strategic interactions of the players. Complex systems can include both of those, but I think 
complex systems theorists view it as mandatory that we try and capture the structure of the, um, the structure of the problem, things like the institutional constraints, the way the institutions interact with each other, and, and don't feel that it's necessary to try and derive the strategic interactions from first principles. We're willing to take some, some different kinds of more pragmatic behavioral assumptions about what people do rather than trying to understand it from some first principles explanations. Um, we also try and port tools from elsewhere in complex systems theory. I think we're going to hear something about these things today. Agent-based modeling, network theory, think about things in terms of nonlinear dynamics and feedback, or to use the term that economists seem to have created for a 50-year-old thing, pro-cyclicality. Um, and I was struck when um, Axel Leijenhoof had made his remark about the web of contracts that constitutes an economy. Uh, I would argue that this web of contracts means that there's a lot of interactions that are already in place, and if you just understand those interactions and you respect um, this web of contracts, um, that you can understand a lot without having to have a deep first principles model of, um, of a strategic interaction. Um, uh, now, I actually made a mistake on this slide. It should have said, why complexity now and why not in economics? And I would argue the reason that complex systems has emerged when it has is because of the digital computer. Um, it allows us to simulate nonlinear dynamics and complex systems, and before we had computers, we really couldn't do that. I had the privilege in nonlinear dynamics to experience uh, the kind of revolution of chaos, uh, which was enabled by the digital computer. Um, and once we had digital computers, we could make pretty tangible progress in getting to the bottom of what was going on that just couldn't be done before. Even if some you know, visionaries like Poincaré were able to get the basic idea, they just couldn't go far enough in working it out. <coughs> um, of course, and, and let me just say, I think the computer revolution is the driving force of science in the last 50 years in physics, in weather, in climate, in ecology, neuroscience, epidemics, traffic, and a lot of fields. I think that revolution has passed economics by. Economists, yes, they use computers to you know, write their papers, to do their regressions, to do their email, but they haven't really realized that you can use a computer to do a serious simulation and that serious simulations should sit in the center of economic practice. That's not the way it works. In contrast, say, to climate or weather, where the simulation incorporates all the knowledge from all the subfields. It produces predictions about what's going on. And to the extent that those predictions fail, that feeds back in to direct the, the, the uh, whole agenda of the whole scientific field. That doesn't happen in economics. Um, and why hasn't it happened in economics? I would say there's two reasons. There's, first of all, the straitjacket of the equilibrium approach. I'm going to come back and say something about that in a minute. And there's the demand for economic content at any cost. Now, for the non-economists in the audience, economic content does not mean what any normal person would think it would mean. You might think economic content would mean that it's relevant for economic phenomena. In economics, economic content means adherence to a certain set of theoretical assumptions that economic phenomena should be derived from selfish individuals maximizing their utility. And if you don't do that in a paper, your paper is deemed to not have economic content, and uh, is ge it's generally a standard reason for rejection at uh, top journals. Um, uh, I think that's been a big impediment to the field. It's a bit like in physics if we demanded that all theories come from quarks. Uh, that's not what we do. You make a theory that just moves from one level to another, it's typically phenomenological in some way. Um, now, an another issue, I, I already mentioned equilibrium, is that I'm going to argue that many economic phenomena, in fact, the most important economic phenomena, are not in equilibrium. In fact, are far from equilibrium. And to do that, I'm going to highlight some work I did with Tobias Gala and more recently with James Saunders, uh, in which we just make up games at random. Our goal is to understand what happens in a typical game. So we make up games at random. We've studied most exhaustively players using reinforcement learning to use their strategy for playing the game. Reinforcement learning, something that's shown to be a good, good model of how people behave in economic experiments. People take the strategies that are working well and 
augment them and they take the strategies that aren't working well and don't use them as often. Um, uh, and we study complicated games, that is games in which there are a lot of moves, like say playing the stock market, where you might have the option of investing in a thousand different stocks. So you have a thousand different possible moves depending on which stocks you want to buy or sell. <clears throat> and different payoffs depending on the move you make and the moves the other players in the game make. Um, so in the model we make, we have two parameters, a competition parameter, gamma, which is the correlation between the payoffs of the players, and a memory parameter, alpha, that's zero when you have infinite memory, when all past history is weighted equally and has a value greater than zero if recent weights, if you think what's happened recently is more important. Now, so we studied this, and to summarize the, the, the paper, if we look at two-player games, we get a phase diagram. We get a diagram that looks like this, and I don't know if I can make the laser, oh, there we go, laser pointer's working. So on this axis, we have the competition. So we vary the competition of the games. From at the bottom here, we have uh, zero-sum games, which are completely competitive. In the middle, we have games where gamma is zero, where the, where the, the, the games are neither competitive nor anti-competitive. And games were in a, that are in a sense cooperative, in the sense that if uh, up here at the, in the, at the game, if one player gets a positive payoff, the other player is also likely to get a positive payoff. Down here, if one player gets a positive payoff, the other player more likely gets a negative payoff. And there's a continuum. So that's what this axis is, and this axis is the time scale. So down here, the players look back to the far past. They believe there's no weighting on the relevance of past versus recent moves. Over here, they put heavier weighting on recent moves. Now, the diagram is that in this yellow region, we see unique fixed points. We do see convergence to equilibrium. But in these other regions, well, things are more complicated. In this region up here, that is in the um, uh, non-competitive games where the competition parameter is greater than zero, we see multiple fixed points. And I'm not talking about two, we typically, typically see hundreds of fixed points. So depending on the exact starting conditions, five. five, okay, dear, all right. Depending on the exact starting conditions, you go to different fixed points. Down here, we see chaos. The, through time, the, the way the players play wanders throughout the space in a chaotic and high dimensional way. It's effectively random. Uh, and, and then what happens is when we look at M player games, Chaos takes over more and more of this space, so in the limit, as the number of players gets large, it takes over the entire space for gamma less than zero. That is, competitive games typically show chaotic behavior. So what does this mean? It means that equilibrium methods fail for complex games with many players, and when it fails, um, in the chaotic regime, strategies never settle down. You see fads. You see something that can be interpreted as market reflexivity because the way the players play influence the payoffs they get, which influences the way they play. Um, the players are using simple heuristics as they chase each other around. I think the only hope you have is some form of agent-based modeling. And by the way, we see things like clustered volatility and the time dependence of the payoffs, which is common in financial markets. Now, um, I think complexity has the potential to make economic theory, maybe I should say, more useful by providing tools to study non-equilibrium behavior, um, by getting, breaking out of the straitjacket of equilibrium modeling, which I think has crippled economics by requiring unwieldy closed form solutions and forcing the discarding of essential structural features. You can't take an economic, a complex economic problem Throw out the baby with the bathwater just because you want to drive some cute economic results on a model that no longer has the essence of the problem in it and expect to have any level of realism. I also think it has the potential to really empower behavioralism to do what it ought to be able to do, and which I don't think it's done. I don't think it's done it for two reasons. That is, it's still mired in the same style of, of economic modeling that was taught to the people that are doing it. And I also think behavioralism needs to put in more specificity about context, the kind of work that, say, Kars Hamas' group is doing, where you focus on the context in which economic decisions are really made and not just on vague properties like, or not vague properties, but, but inadequate properties to make a model like overconfidence, 
We know that people are overconfident, but if we want to actually make a model of their behavior so we capture the heuristics they're using, we have to understand those heuristics in the style of Gergener's talk of, you know, how, do, how does the baseball player actually ca catch the ball? How does the um, banker actually make the decision about whether or not to make a loan? We need that level of behavioral model. Um, so I think the complexity approach can potentially liberate um, behavioralism to do what it can do and capture institutions and structural relationships. Now, um, a few success stories um, on this panel. I think we're going to see several from the other speakers. Um, I list some of my own, but I think in, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip over them. You can go look at my paper. Um, I, I want to focus on one, though, the last one there, which is an agent-based um, housing model we've made for Washington, D.C. In this model, um, which is an effort of a large number of people, something I think needs to happen more often in economics, you actually have a larger scale project, which was funded by INET now a little over a year ago. We set out to, to make an agent-based model in which we make conditional forecasts and calibrate the model in the same way an econometrician calibrates an econometric model. A difference in the kind of forecast is we make conditional forecasts. So we're not saying this will happen unconditionally in the future. We say this will happen if the following conditions are met. Something else will happen if other conditions are met. Um, so we take as exogenous variables um, migration, wealth dynamics, interest rates, lending policy. All of those things are just exogenous inputs we put into the model. And we, by simulating housing market, where people uh, put their houses on the market and there's individual households that buy and sell houses, um, we try and predict prices, um, the inventory of houses through time, default rates, uh, and um, we do this conditionally on the exogenous variables. Um, so I, I'm just about to do my last slide. Let me just say, we've, we've We've, this has required intense gathering of data sets at the level of individuals. So we are not using the same kind of data that the econometricians are using. And, but I'll, uh, rather than telling you more about that, I just want to go to my last substantive slide here just to show you the results. So this is the housing bubble in the Washington, D.C. area. And we compare the data and the dash line to the model and the solid line. You can see we capture it pretty well. We look at the number of units sold in the solid line versus in our model versus the dash line for the data. We look at the number of days that houses set on the market for the solid line versus the dash line. So we're able to recreate the, the data pretty well, the time series pretty well. Now, I'm not going to pat us too much on the back because, frankly, this model is probably overfit at this stage. On the other hand, right away, I think we can say something, at least a tentative conclusion, that is, um, at least in Washington, D.C., lending policy is the dominant cause of the housing bubble. How do we do that? Well, we look at counterfactuals. What happens if we made interest rates constant? The bubble's damped, but it's still there. On the other hand, what happens if we hold lending policy constant so that we never had the lax lending policy that was instituted by the lenders? The bubble just vanishes. Um, so I think this approach shows a lot of promise. So to wrap up, I won't even read the top bullets. You can read them to yourself. Um, I just want to uh, say that I think this approach maximizes, has good cost to benefit characteristics. We can get a lot of knowledge with minimal behavioral assumptions. Um, I've been bothered by statements at this conference that economics cannot be understood via mathematical modeling. I think it misses the point. You have to do the right kind of mathematical modeling. You have to model reality from the bottom up rather than fantasy from the top down. And I think, um, as a physicist, I'm always struck by statements that, oh, the problem with economics is it's too much like physics. You will never hear a physicist say that. Economics bears no resemblance to the physics that I know. And I think the problem is that it's not enough like physics. It has a conception of physics that's completely wrong. And I, I, I hope that um, you know, the leaders of the meeting can understand this. And in the, in the future meeting of the, uh, you know, when we finally convert this from the Institute of New Economic Thinking to the Institute of Sound Economic Thinking, I think that uh, complexity economics will play a central role. Good. Thank you, Joe.
and that gets terrific.